Hello and welcome back to the Duke Rap Lecture Series. I'm Jeff Gaddison, and today we're going to be discussing the structure of peripheral nerves and why an understanding of nerve structure is critical to the safe and effective practice of peripheral nerve blocks. Now, I want to disclose that I've borrowed several images from this excellent book that is edited by Miguel Reyna. If you have any interest at all in nerves or histology or just enjoy looking at amazing micrographs, I highly recommend getting your hands on one. And I know you're thinking, oh, histology, but wait, don't hit stop. I promise this is extremely relevant to clinical practice. So let's go on an adventure. When you ask a junior resident to draw a nerve, you get some interesting results. I love this drawing for several reasons. This person has got several of the keywords correct, if maybe not in the right location. They get the idea that there are fascicles within the nerve. I totally love the honesty. And I also like that this looks like the Death Star. This one is a keeper. But examples like this highlight that many of us lack a complete understanding of how nerves are put together. Okay, so let's build the nerve together. I want you to think of the nerve as being composed of two distinct types of elements. The first is the parenchyma, and the other is the stroma. The parenchymal tissue comprise the functional units of nerve tissue, while the stroma is the scaffold that holds it together. And to get more precise, those functional units are axons and Schwann cells, while the stroma is all the remaining connective tissue. One axon and its accompanying enveloping sheath of myelin derived from Schwann cells is what we mean when we say nerve fiber. Now some axons are unmyelinated and so the axon alone is the fiber. In this micrograph you can see the insulating effect of the Schwann cells as they wrap around and around the myelinated axons compared to the unmyelinated nerve fibers. We're all familiar with cartoons like this showing the relationship of the myelin sheath to the axon and that of course creates the conditions for saltatory conduction of nerve impulses. Here's an even closer view of an axon in the multiple thin lamellae of the Schwann cells that wrap around this cell over 30 times. Now, if we take a collection of nerve fibers and put them together in one packet like a bundle of sticks, we now have a fascicle. The word fascicle does in fact take its meaning from the Latin for bundle. The fascicle is the physiologic unit of the peripheral nerve system. The fascicle is surrounded by a structure called the perineurium. This is a multi-layer sheath of flattened cells that have a basal lamina and tight junctions and is about seven to 15 layers thick. It's very tough and dense and serves to restrict and regulate the exchange of materials between the endoneural microenvironment and the extracellular space or epineurium. It's commonly called the blood nerve barrier, but since it's metabolically active, it's more appropriately called the blood nerve interface. One of its most important roles is to mechanically protect the sensitive nerve fibers within from stress and trauma, something that's critical to safety when needles are poking around in the vicinity. Here's a zoomed in view of the dense, almost squamous-like structure of the perineurium. In the lower left corner, you can see some loose areolar tissue and you can appreciate the structural difference in these two tissues. Okay, so we know that the fascicle is made up of fibers within the perineurium, but they're not just dry packed in there. They're surrounded and supported by a loose, soft connective tissue matrix called the endoneurium. It's mostly loose collagen and ground substance, but there are some cellular components too, and importantly, some capillaries. This will become important later. Here's a micrograph of the inside of a fascicle. You can see a handful of nerve fibers, remember that's an axon plus or minus its myelinated sheath, that are surrounded and supported by the endoneurium. The endoneurial tubes are channels within the supportive matrix that act as scaffolds and are important in promoting nerve regrowth after injury. There's a small amount of fluid in the endoneurium too, which can be thought of as roughly equivalent to the CSF of the peripheral nerve. The endoneurial fluid pressure is slightly higher than that found outside the fascicle, about 2-3 to three millimeters of mercury, and it's been proposed that this gradient may have evolved as a protective mechanism against contamination of the intrafascicular environment by toxins. This study by Dag Sielander and colleagues highlights that pressure gradient. When the perineurium is breached, the endoneurial contents tend to herniate out of the fascicle, which is not ideal for nerve function to say the least. And then we come to the stuff that is outside the fascicles. Those remaining bits and pieces comprise the epineurium. It's mostly loose, permeable areolar tissue that allows for some shifting of fascicles within the nerve with limb movement. There's also a good amount of fat and collagen, but also elastin, which helps to resist longitudinal stress on the nerve. At the periphery, the epineurium condenses to form an investing sheath so that the nerve can slide between muscles and fascia. And I like to think of the epineurium as a fruit, with a soft inside and a thickened, denser rind on the outside. Mmm, epineurium is delicious. Epineurium makes up a lot of the cross-sectional area of a nerve, generally between 30 to 70%, but this depends on the nerve. 
There are two broad histologic rules that we can rely on here. One, the greater the number of individual fascicles within the nerve, the thicker the epineurium. And secondly, nerves generally have a higher proportion of fibers and fascicles at the root level and pick up more epineurium and connective tissue as the nerve makes its way to the periphery. This is why interscaling roots look dark on ultrasound. They're essentially monofascicles. As you travel along the brachial plexus, the nerves become oligofascicular and then polyfascicular, which explains why the median nerve, for example, looks hyperechoic from all the connective tissue. The notable exception is the subgluteal sciatic nerve, which is composed of 70 to 80% epineurium, perhaps as a protective adaptation to the mechanical stress near the hip joint. It's important to understand that fascicles don't travel down nerves like wire in a cable. The great Australian anatomist Sidney Sunderland demonstrated that fascicles break apart and recombine many times over the course of their journey, and the fascicular topography varies substantially even over a few centimeters. Importantly, there are multiple fine connections between fascicles that we probably can't see with ultrasound. So when we think we see a nerve cluster with three fascicles in it, that's not the whole picture by a long shot. This micrograph shows two large fascicles, which may or may not be discernible on ultrasound, with some fine fascicular connections, which are almost certainly not visible. All right, so what's the point I'm trying to make with these observations? There are some clinical consequences to these anatomic and histologic realities. Number one, we must absolutely stay outside the fascicle with our needles. We've got data going back to the 1970s showing that breaching the perineurium does bad things to the tissues inside. Once the barrier of the perineurium is violated, those fibers are unprotected from mechanical and chemical trauma, both of which have been shown to occur. These rats all had intrafascicular injections of various local anesthetics. In each case, we see needle tracks, which can't be good, as well as demyelination and Wallerian degeneration. You can see the different degree of injury in each, with S being severe, I being intermediate, and N representing normal tissue. There's an ischemic risk too. If the volume and or pressure increases within the fascicle, this may put pressure on the capillaries within the endoneurium. In addition, this creates a pinch point at the spot where the small, nutritive blood vessels penetrate the perineurium, kinking the vessel and putting the fibers at risk for hypoperfusion. Number two, it's probably a good idea to stay outside the epineurium as well as in, let's just stay outside the whole nerve. In another rat study, extrafascicular application of 0.75% ropivacaine caused demyelination and axonal loss in up to 25% of the cross-sectional area of the nerve. Now, that's a fairly high concentration, but it goes to show that even outside the fascicle, local anesthetics are directly neurotoxic, and we should place them outside the nerve and let the concentration gradient do its thing. There has been talk of improving block onset and duration by getting inside the nerve but between the fascicles. We already know that there are a ton of interfascicular connections we just can't see, and that leads to phenomena such as fascicular nicking and vascular disruption. Not great to have an intraneural hematoma for the sake of a couple of extra minutes saved in block onset time. We do tend to think of fascicles as floating within the loose areole or epineurium, and maybe a blunt block needle would push them aside rather than penetrate them. This is not always the case, as we see here in this elegant study of fresh human sciatic nerve. I don't like the idea of saying to a patient, look, I'm going to put this needle inside your nerve and it's going to cut 3% of your delicate nerve fibers, but the surgeon can make incision two minutes faster. Remember, needles don't block nerves. Local anesthetic does. Number three, that ratio of connective tissue to neural tissue matters. The epineurium is a cushion and serves to distribute blunt mechanical force around the fascicles, protecting them. This effect is related to the number and size of fascicles, so on the left, that huge single fascicle is going to suffer the brunt of the force, whereas on the right, the epineurium acts much more like a shock absorber. It is hard to say if that principle holds true for penetrating trauma. It might be that the higher the proportion of epineurium, the fewer number of axons that might get speared. If we look at examples where there are only a few large fascicles within a nerve, this might give us some guidance. The common peroneal nerve is a good example as it only has one to three large fascicles at the level of the popliteal fossa. Similarly, the roots of the brachial plexus where we do the interscaling block are, as we said, essentially monofascicles. So perhaps it's no surprise that the two biggest culprits in terms of risk for long-term nerve injury are interscaling and lateral popliteal. Nerve injury is multifactorial, obviously, and we know that the block is not always the cause in many cases. However, the point here is that histology matters, and while we should always be careful with nerve blocks, we need to be extremely attentive to needle tip position with these specific techniques.
In summary, nerves are complex structures comprising a parenchyma of fibers and an elaborate stroma of connective tissue. The tough, dense perineurium is the last line of defense against mechanical and chemical injury to the nerve fibers and should be respected. The proportion of connective to neural tissue seems to matter with respect to risk for nerve injury. And finally, all the evidence that we have to date suggests that we shouldn't enter the nerve with our needle. We are built fairly tough as human beings, and there have been those that argue that intraneural or interfascicular injections are safe, and hey, by the way, look at my low rates of nerve injury. The anatomy and histology do not support that viewpoint, and I do question whether the purported advantage of some minutes saved is worth the potential risk. Thanks for your time, and I hope you'll tune in to more from this lecture series.